Hey, everybody. I just finished recording my interview with Lorna Byrne, best-selling author of many books on angels. And I'm almost speechless. It was such a powerful, powerful interview. Imagine being able to see angels objectively your entire life. The stories she's going to share with you in this talk that's coming up now will open your hearts and your mind to what is around us all the time. Stay through to the very end because her words of wisdom will touch you in a way, well, certainly in a way that I've never felt before. I feel very blessed to be able to share Lorna Byrne with you here today. Great. With that, we're good to go. Okay. Hey, everybody. We have done quite a few shows lately about angels. And no wonder, don't we all love them? And those of you who might be skeptical, because I know I have some left brain people in my community, may not be quite convinced that angels are real. So to that end, I have a guest today who will help you tremendously. I'm going to do something a little different. If you've been following my podcast for a while, you know that I very rarely read anybody's biography. But in reading over my guest, Lorna Burns' biography, I just was guided to read it to all of you because the, the feel that's in the words will set the tone for this talk, as well as make you sit up straight when you hear it and say, wow, I want to hear from her. So let me pull up the bi biography here. All right. Spiritual teacher, international best-selling author, and philanthropist Lorna Byrne has dedicated her life to remind humanity of the spiritual potential within us all. I love that. She is the author of seven best-selling books, including Angels in My Hair, which I just completed reading, A Message of Hope. How's that for the Messages of Hope podcast? A Message of Hope from the Angels and Angels at My Fingertips and has been published in more than 50 countries and 30 languages around the world. Her teachings are the result of a remarkable gift, a divine connection, providing her with incredible detailed knowledge of the spiritual side of life. Now, here's the part that'll really get you. Unlike others, this gift is not from meditation, visualization, or even from books or study. It exists as a natural part of her walking life. Learn, Lorna, Lorna Byrne has physical sight of the unseen world, of the angels, spirits, and other spiritual beings that she says are guiding and teaching us every second of every day. Lorna says we all have this potential, and that it's part of humanity's evolution for people to connect back to their spiritual self so the body and soul intertwine. Lorna's vision of the future is one where there is no division or boundaries between people. Amen where our spiritual side is accepted and transcends all beliefs, to accept we are all one, to live in peace with each other and nature, our home. Wow, what an introduction. Lorna, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for having me on your show as well. So I have to thank God and, and the angels for, for that because you yourself are an incredible person and you yourself do a lot of work to bring hope to the world. And I think that's one thing that even your listeners must remember too, that you help to do that and you help to stir hope within them for them too, to bring it within their own life and their family and those that they bump into on the street in, in, that, in that way. We all have to be, you know, that light of hope for the world you know, but especially for ourselves as well. And I just love the angel of hope. That is an incredible angel. I don't see him every day, but on occasions I do. And just such a, a powerful and strong angel. And it's just the way he holds that incredible lantern. It's 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 a flame. It it always reminds me something like um you know, the Olympic torch, but it's absolutely massive. And the flame from it, you know, just shines so much light. And then at times seeing him in proportion in front of a human being. And I love the way he does this. He becomes in proportion. And remember, he it's like the clothing, which is the angel, you know, comes over the head and, and right down to, to the ground and is kind of this white color but this lantern that he hopes this torch 
And it's just the way he turns to beckon to someone and doing this to come, not to give up. And just seeing the angel of hope in the world um, today is, to me, it gives such hope, you know, and he's beckoning us all. And God has this incredible angel in the world to encourage us to not to give up, to keep the hope there, to keep the hope there for each and every one of us. Wow. Wow. I, I didn't even know there is an angel of hope. So that's, you mesmerized me there. Oh, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> it's not your normal intro to an interview. And, and I promised you all, didn't I? This is going to be a special interview. Lorna, you're coming to us today from Ireland. I, I just have a feeling you haven't moved very much in your whole life from, from one area. Is that right? Um, yes, God God has been keeping me in Ireland as such now. He has had me travel the world um, for the last eight years or more. I forget how many years. Time and me don't work together in that sense. Um, it was for about, you know, six to nine months out of the year. But now I'm going to stay at home more, you know, um, and God has to encourage people then to come as well. In, in that way, um, the miracles that God has allowed to happen and the angels. And there's, there's such long stories, and I haven't written about them all, but the sanctuary that we have that's five minutes down the road down here, I was shown that even as a child and, you know, took no notice of it, and even as a teenager. And then the time when I was coming down this area with, with Joe and my children, um, and when we pass these gates, these two pillars and these real old gates, Archangel Michael stood there and it was like for me, the car went in slow motion, but it didn't really. And Archangel Michael just said, you will live there one day. And Joe turned to me as he was driving and said, are you all right? And I answered him and said, I'm, I'm OK. And I remember giving out on that particular day to Archangel Michael because I could see this little roof over the wall, you know, and Joe was already sick, you know, um, and saying, you haven't got a hope because that won't work. It's too small in that in that sense. Um, and it was after Joe died and many years after Joe died, um, how would I say, my son rang me and said, Mom, there's something for sale, but I'm going to show you. We don't have the money for it, you know, which I, I still don't have money myself in that sense because we're giving as much as possible. And um, he just shows me this video. He says, click on it. He was on the phone and I was on the screen here. So I clicked on it. And what do you think the first thing I saw? those two pillars and that gate and that gave me a, a shock and I held my breath and I just said God and angels what are you up to Archangel Michael what are you doing and then the the video went on down the lane this dusty little little lane and came to this enormous house um, and then I, I remembered how would I say this? I know this probably blow people's brains away or annoy them in some way. But, you know, even as a child and a teenager, I actually stood in that in that house um, and God holding my hands, looking out these enormous windows. Now, they are huge windows. You know, some of them are even doors, but they're a window. You know, and just being so shocked. And my son, again, he listened to his guardian angel and to God. And he sent this link to someone because that's another part of the story. And this this couple said, oh, that's it. We're buying it. They bought it and they gave it. And then they gave, you know, means to start to, you know, fix it up, repair it. And so has so many other people. But the incredible thing is, I've been reminded so many times that it's still going to be here in 300 years and more. So is it, I don't is know it a sanctuary? Is it's it a sanctuary or is it your house? 
Oh, it's a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It's a sanctuary. I, this is the farmhouse that you speak that I talk about in Angels in My Hair. And okay. this is this is the farmhouse. Um, and it is an incredible place as well. This is where I came after Joe had died with my little girl. And I suppose maybe for readers to remember, because I heard you say the left part of the brain, you know, and I, I don't exactly know why you said that, but I use the left part of my brain more than I use the right. So I found that amazing when you said that in that in that way. And I can't read or write as such, you know, um, or say go left or right. I'm dyslexic, but I'm across the board. I'm not just one section of it. I'm across the board. So even directions, I'd be looking at you. What are you talking about <laughs> in that in that way? But yet God worked it all out that I could write. Technology changed, so I could give the message to to the world to help people you know, to open their minds for that intertwining of the body and soul. And I want that to happen. I, I want that hope to come into the world. And we're all part of it. That yeah. peace. When I said that I had the feeling that you hadn't moved much, I didn't mean not traveling. I meant I just had this sense that when I finished reading your book, that was the first one. I haven't read the others, but I sure want to now. But I had this sense that you were still in that exact same area and you are. It, it just feels like a vortex for you. But Lorna, let's just go back to, would you share with people from the very beginning how you, how you view the world and the angels in it? What, what is your personal experience that you now know is different from most people? Well, I, I suppose as, as a child, the angels were always reminding me, you know, when something might be said, you know, when, when you're a child and, you know, you're, you're told by adults and you're always being reminded that you're retired, you know, because I couldn't read or write and I found things confusing when someone said go right or left or, you know, or colors. It's like the whole lot. And they would always say to me, you know, they know no better. So they taught me how to love. The angels did? Yes, they taught yeah. me how to love in the sense of when they would say they know no better and I must love them for that. Hmm. So I, I think, you know, I do view the world differently because I really don't know what, what the world is like for you to see because I have been seeing the angels since I was born physically, and it's normal. I, I would be shocked if I went down the road one day and saw people walking towards me and didn't see the light of their guardian angel or didn't see other angels in, in and around them or even the soul of a loved one fleeting by in that, that sense. So I see them physically, but I see so much more. I only tell you a little bit and I don't understand why you can't. That's the part I don't understand. And that's the part I don't understand either, except that it, I believe our lack of seeing our, our spiritual blindness causes us to follow the heart more. Because one thing you may not know about my background, we were talking at the beginning, but most of the people watching this show come to watch it because they identify with my, again, I'll use that term left brain background where you have to prove to me that something is real because I can't see. And I, I come from a military background. I served 20 years in the Navy and was very by the book, never saw angels, and now guarantee people that they're real because of the evidence from the non-physical experiences, but you have that physical evidence, so you don't you don't need evidence. That to me feels like such a gift. Did you always see it as a gift, or was it also at times something you wish you didn't have? I I never saw it as a gift because I didn't understand that word. I I didn't even know what that word was. And even today, when someone says, you know you're so gifted. But to me, it's normal. 
I, I still don't quite understand. It's it's like um, sometimes I, I don't understand the human side, but I understand the spiritual side. Because you've got to remember, the angels have educated me. They've taught me everything I know. Mm. And they've taught me how to hear and how to see. And just so, so much more as well. It's like, you know, even at this time of the year, you know, that fail between the human world and the spiritual world is just that little bit thinner. And this is this is the time, you know, that we can allow ourselves to love ourselves, allow ourselves to have a little bit more companion, compassion, a little bit more empathy, a little bit more, what would you say, love, because I just love the angels that come at this time of the year carrying those balls of light full of the gifts you can't buy. You know, the way you can't buy hope and you can't buy love, you know, you you can't buy compassion, you can't buy peace. It's not for sale. It's inside of you. And that's your soul. That spark of light of God. And that's what so much wants to connect to the human being. But what has happened is mankind doesn't allow that. It did long ago, probably at some stage. But it's like if someone turned around to you and said, you know, I can see the angel beside you, you know, and they're in the same room, you'd probably take a deep breath and say, oh, this is a lunatic. Now I, I had that happen. <laughs> I, I, have like that. Called, I have been called that, but that doesn't matter because I know God and the angels are real. And, and I would have, you know, priests and bishops and rabbis and um. I don't know what you call it, other religions, you know, the, the leaders of other religions. And they, do you know what? Back a few years ago, before the pandemic, when it happened first, I was literally shocked when a rabbi came up to me, the first one that came up and said, Lorna, I'd love to know, is God real? And I was shocked. Wow. Wow. You yeah. Know, because I always believed humanly that, you know, priests and nuns and rabbis and bishops are, you know, of all the different religions know that God is real. And so many have asked that question of me. And I just say, yes, God is real. Why, why wait till the moment when your human body dies to discover that? Why not start to open up now, you know, and allow yourself to see and hear, allow yourself to feel that love and compassion and to be guided through life. And, you know, life is not all about material things, because if you have a loved one that is in need, like I've had so many parents who, who have turned around and said, I would give everything away. I'd rather be homeless if my lo loved one could live. You know, and and that is that's heart rendering in in that in that sense, you know, and um, but the angels are there, and I love the unemployed angels wanting to help us all of the time. Like, let's let's stop there a second. Yes, yeah. you all heard her right. She said the unemployed angels. Would you tell everybody about this? Yeah, and I I love the unemployed angels. The first time I actually. How would I say? I never wrote the story fully, you know, but I named the unemployed angels. I gave them that name as a child and didn't even understand the word unemployed. And I don't know, how would I say? I never heard it used except one time my father became unemployed. Um, and I was, I was quite young, maybe it's hard to judge, maybe between five and seven at the time and just seeing these angels, you know, tumbling down from the heavens. If you can imagine like a ball, you know, like a ball, I always say, you know, God is emptying them in the bucketfuls out, you know, oh, they're, great. Tumbling. Yeah. <laughs> they're tumbling down. <laughs> but the most beautiful thing about them is, you know, just as they come to the earth, they, that ball, that angel opens up. You know, because they have their wings wrapped around them. That's what the ball is huh. in that in that sense. And, of course, angels' feet don't touch the ground. 
there's always this cushion, you know, with just just below their feet. And just seeing them every day, you know, walking, moving in and out between people and stopping at moments, you know, in the hope that they will be employed. But when I see where a human being has employed an unemployed angel, it's actually lovely to watch. You know, it, it could be even a child, you know, that has employed an unemployed angel just to walk beside them. Just and to be please tell, tell us, how do we employ angels? Um, the unemployed angel, just go and ask for them. Just say, listen here, I want an unemployed angel to help me today. But you can send unemployed angels to anywhere in the world as well. You can say, my aunt could do it, an unemployed angel. You could say, where there has been an accident, they could do it, some unemployed angels. And they will go, you're employing them. You know, you just call call out. And the thing about the unemployed angel is that they're still pouring down from the heavens. So we must still really need them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. So... I'm telling unemployed angels to go to yourself and all of your listeners. And sometimes I would say, you know, at the end of the day, you know, just sit and thought for a moment and see, can you recognize where things were a little bit easier, where they helped you? That gratitude shifts everything. Yeah. Acknowledge their help, right? Yeah. And I, I love another thing. I only heard this recently um, where... A priest um, is talking now about the unemployed angels, you know, during his sermon at Mass. Oh, yeah. You know, seemingly, um, and not here in Ireland, this is in America somewhere, oh. and seemingly told um, the congregation, you know, don't forget to call on an unemployed angel to give you a helping hand. And that's, that was that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Um, I'm always amazed the way. You know, I can't read or write as such, you know, but yet when God had said, even as a child, an Archangel Michael and an Archangel Gabriel, you know, that the books would become bestsellers, you know, and then just only to hear that back last week, you know, when I was doing a workshop, um, the young woman saying, this is what my priest said at Mass, and that she was shocked. You know, in the sense that that the priest at mass, you know, mentioned the unemployed angels, and we all should call on them. Absolutely. You just re reminded me, or maybe Spirit put it in my head, that I'd like you to talk about how often the angels are putting thoughts in our head, because so many people don't realize we're being guided all the time. Would you talk about that, please? Yeah, they're putting thoughts in into our mind all of the time. And sometimes someone might say that's a good, good feeling, but they're constantly doing that to guide you in life. It's like even for you now to ask that question. But a lot of the time we ignore those thoughts. But one thing you must remember, your guardian angel or any other angel will never ask you to do anything wrong. They won't ask you to hurt anyone, to steal anything, you know, anything at all. They're, they're the ones that, which I love this bit, um, that gives us the guilty conscience so that we won't do something. Ah, you know, okay. Good. They they do, they do that. But we're very good at, you know, pushing that part away. But that's your guardian angel and other angels trying to help you. But they're always teaching us as well. And I think adults are always asking, well, what does it mean? It's like, you know, if my guardian angel said to me now, you know, pick up your phone. Don't ask why. And don't be lazy, because most of the time we won't bother, you know. And um, it's, it's like even, you know, pick up your glass of water or go and make yourself a cup of tea, or, you know, go and make that phone call, or, you know, it can be so, so simple. But a lot of the time, the angels tell me, we ignore it, and we are being lazy at times. 
I used to feel embarrassed using that word, but they told me to use that word lazy. <laughs> Good. Um, so I, I apologize for it um, because they're trying to teach you to respond. And these are all just little things. They don't have a meaning, but they have a big meaning because you're learning. So that when something really important happens and you need to do something, you will do it automatically because you hear it in whatever way it is, you know. And then you say, great, I did it myself. And yeah. your guardian angel and God loves that. They don't need praise for helping you. But they don't love mind, though. <laughs> I know, I know. And sometimes, uh, sometimes I would always say, you know, say thanks as well, you know. So if if some of your listeners are sitting there, you know, and they're listening, and after the show, a thought comes into their mind to get up and go for a walk, or you know, go and make that cup of tea, or go and give that phone call to someone. You know, go and do it because, again, sometimes when they put a message like that into your mind, it doesn't have a meaning for you, but it has a meaning for someone else. Or yes. it has a meaning for something in nature as well. You know, the whole time you're speaking, it reminds me, I, I have a book coming out in April. It's called The Awakened Way, and that's living an awakened life. The subtitle is Making the Shift to a Divinely Guided Life. And I love what you just talked about because it shows us that doesn't just mean by God alone. God presents as the angels, as you and me, as that person who shows up in your path. And so when you live the awakened way, what you're showing me is just notice that even just, I think I'll go get that cup of tea or I think I'll pick up that phone. When you just flow like that, that is being divinely guided. Yes, it is. I, I just say to remind people, you know, don't forget to smile. You know, people will, will say to me, Lorna, you know, I, I want to be a healer, but nurses and doctors, anyone that works in the healing profession in any as aspect are healers, but we're all healers. And that's just something we don't realize. We think it's it's something just, you know, special and it'll make you great in that that sense but every mother every child everyone is a healer because we all have that spark of light of god you know it's so so tiny and what i love about it is the soul fills every part of you but it's out there as well you know you're part of creation as well you're part of hope you shine you know so it's like you're in a cafe or you're walking down the street and suddenly you, you have this feeling, whatever way it may come, are you here to smile? You go and smile because the person walking towards you, you could have saved their life by that smile. You gave them hope. You changed their mind. That's right. You know, whether they weren't wanting to commit suicide or whether they wanting to do something bad, you change their mind to do something good. Yeah. You with the angels. As you were talking about healing, the angels gave me a vision of angels standing over people who are hurting with their hands out like this. I'd never had that vision before, but I'll bet I know you have seen this. Could you talk about that? Um, the angels that, that come for healing, um, they only stay a brief, a brief moment, but it's, and that is, you know, where the prayer, prayer of thy healing angels that's carried from God by the Archangel Michael, that prayer is about them. But the healing hand and the light is God. It's God working through these these angels. And I just love it's usually about maybe sometimes only three, but sometimes maybe five of them. And Oh, it's it's so it's so incredible to watch them and I've only seen it on rare occasions but I know they're constantly at work you know and they're they're there's such a light and it's like you know they're joined together and when they're over someone or around someone yes their hands are going down you know those healing hands 
So know. this brings up a question and so many people watching right now, you know, in your book, you talk about your husband, Joe, who was sick for years, years, and you had been shown even before you married that that would be the path and that he would die and leave you and your children here. Of course, he's still here exists, of course, as spirit. But would you talk to those people who say, well, why didn't the angels heal, heal my loved one and they died? Or I have someone in my life now who's very sick. Why aren't they healing them? Yeah, I know that part is very, very hard to understand. I often gave out to God and the angels, you know, why wasn't Joe healed? You know, why couldn't we grow old together? Even though I had been told we would never grow old together, it wouldn't happen that way. Um, and it was a terrible, a terrible struggle. And at times he would seem to be a bit healthier than other times. And then it got to the stage where he had, you know, one stroke after another, you know, so many things would happen. Um, I don't know why, and I have to be honest, why some are healed and others aren't. There is, it's, it's a miracle. But I do know one thing, and that is, I have never said this before, so people don't really know. Um, Joe wouldn't have been able to cope in life with me doing what God wants me to do. So God took him home to heaven. And that's hard to understand too, you know, but yet on many occasions he would come and visit and I would see him as physically as I see you. After he passed. After he passed, but... He wouldn't be, he wouldn't be sick. Just, just incredible. Like again, that is so hard to describe. To see the soul come and visit and give such a human appearance, but yet that human appearance is so perfect and yet full of light. So, do you do you mean that your understanding is because you would be would become more well known and be traveling the world and giving more workshops that your work was so important that that he came to support you and give you the family but but when it got to that point where you really needed to burst forth his job was over well that's that's a, a very clear way of of saying it and it hurts me even to say yes it hurts me even to say yes, because I give out to God, you know, why isn't he here? Why isn't he, you know, us able to do things? It's it's like the young boy that Noah, you know, he came to a talk and, you know, he was in the audience and I just said to God and the angels, will I go to this child straight away? And I was told no. And the audience filled up with either 750 people or it was a thousand in, in around that area. So the hall was literally packed and no one noticed this child. See, there's the miracle. No one noticed this child. So I gave my talk. And then you mean he was alone? No, he was with his mom and someone else, but no one noticed him. And that's part of the miracle. Like, okay. And then I gave the talk and questions and answers came and loads of people in the audience asked questions. And then the young boy puts his hand up. And I was just waiting and he just just said, um, Rona, I don't have any question. I just want to tell you my guardian angel is my best friend. And that's why we call the children's book that. Um, but I knew there was more to that. But as soon as that boy put his hand up, the whole hall, all the audience went silent. You didn't even hear anyone clear the throat or close move. Complete silence. Because it was only then that they saw him. And then again, the big question came. He did have a question. He asked for he said, Lorna, could you ask God for the gift of life? And again, the audience remained silent. There wasn't even a breeze. How, how can you say it? Not even a fly going around the room. There, there was nothing. No one moved. The silence was 
unbelievable. And the place was full of angels, just full of them. And the healing angels were around him. And, and when he asked me for the gift, to ask God for the gift of life, I already knew the answer. But you don't tell the answer. And I said to this young boy, Noah, yes, um, I will ask God for the gift of life for you, but I can only ask. That's all I can do. And then, you know, I asked everyone to pray. And it was only at that moment when I asked everyone to pray for this child that they started to move. It was like as if they were in a trance or so focused on the child because the child had a tube in his neck. He had a machine beside him. He had um, some kind of thing on the head with wires and all coming out. Um, so I did bless him and we did pray. And then he came, he, he would be what I would have called an extreme case. Don't I don't advertise it as such, but he found his way and his family found his way. So they spent time here in Ireland with us um, on different occasions. And every time he went back home, the hospital couldn't understand why he was still alive. He was given extra time, you know, and we have lovely photographs of him down in the sanctuary. We have this enormous tree that he would have swung out of, you know, with the ivy, swung out of, um, and we call that Noah's tree. Yeah. So, you know, again, God didn't heal this young child, but this child was given extra time. And the parents have given me permission to talk about him and to write the story of Noah. Um, and again, I suppose that will help the world as well in some in some way. But then I have seen, you know, where people have been healed, because I know I do the blessing as well, where somebody might just whisper in my ear as I'm going to the next person, you know, thank you, I'm well now. I've be, I've I've got well or or sometimes I know you'll read in the books where someone was considered, you know, a vegetable. Like I remember going into the hospital to a young man and the family and everyone had given up. And again, the mother listened, or it was the grandmother, I can't clearly remember just now, um, gave me a call and said, you're coming to England, I believe, to give a talk. Please come to the hospital to see our son. I know he'll wake up if you come. Now, the doctors and all were aware I was going. You know, they were told. So they had, you know, the curtain around him and everything like that. And I'm skipping loads of the story now. And I just went up to the young man and I prayed over him. And I whispered in his ear the words that God told me to say. And seemingly he woke up after I left. You know, like, and miracles do happen. But... It's God that works the miracle. As I say to everyone, I can only ask on your behalf. Can you tell us when when you were in there with the, the boy in the with coma? The young, with the young man. Um, uh, what kind of angels, how many of our angels were around you? It's so normal to you, you probably don't even yeah, think. It's normal. It's normal to me. So like even the room here is full of angels at the moment, you know, um, how would I say I'd have to, you know, I was in once, you know, brought through the hospital and all the time as I was walking through the hospital, there was just, it was like as if I was walking through, even though the, the mother was there and other members of the family, but they didn't see the angels, but we were walking through a corridor of angels. That's the best way to put it, a corridor of angels. And then when I was brought into intensive care where the young man was, you know, um, the doctors had just been attending them, attending him and the nurses, and they just looked at me. But the whole room was so full of light. There was, to me, 
hundreds of angels there, just hundreds of them. And then seeing the, the healing angels around the bed and they just waiting for me to come. And just walking over to the bed because I had to go in on my own. You know, that that's the way the doctors wanted it. And just um, just tuck his hand. His, his mom did come in, I remember now. His mom did come in because the angels were telling me, Lorna, his mom went in. And she touched, I think, his hand. And she just said, Lorna's here now. And then she left. Something, something like that. She went out through the the curtains. Now it was, it wasn't like you know in the hospital bed where the curtains are right up around the bed. This was bigger because different type of of ward, um, and just all the angels there and the healing angels. I just just love them. They just how would I say? They glowed such a light from their hands. You know, and I just walked over and touched the young man. And I prayed for a few moments and I and I said this this prayer, you know, the prayer that God had given me. Um, and then I was told to whisper in his ear. And I did that. And then I just left. And it was like at that moment, as I started to walk away, some of the angels remained, but most of them seemed to be leaving. That's the only way I, I can, can describe. Um, and it was, I think the next day, I got a message from the mother saying that, you know, her son had woken up. And things were good. So imagine... Things being good, that's all that matters. Because nothing is about me. It's about you, everyone else out there in the world. I would say, I am nothing. You are something. You're more precious than I am. Oh, I would disagree. To, I would no, disagree. No, no, this You're is what all, all to say. unique. <laughs> no, I'm not making you more special, Lorna. I'm just putting all of us on this equal playing yeah. field. It's all beautiful lights, everybody. Yes, yes. yes definitely. Yeah. As you were speaking, I'm, I'm feeling very emotional because I'm dealing with some uh, challenging news and integrating that. And as you were speaking, I, I feel, I sense a strong angel on each side just lifting me up and and feeling the urge to tell everybody that, you know, we say, we feel like, well, that's my imagination because we can't see them. But what do you say to people who say that's my imagination? I, I would say to you, it's not your imagination. And the most important thing to remember is an angel will never ask you to do anything wrong, not even to say anything wrong in that, in, in any, in any way, it'll always ask you to help and ask you to love yourself as well ask if if you're in doubt like ask your guardian angel for a sign but for something easy because they can't they're not going to go out there and have a brand new car appear outside your door you know what i mean in that way or you know or, or here in in europe you win the lotto you know and um, you have a chance like ev everyone else but ask for a sign. And lots of people do ask for a feather. It's the most common because that's easy to, to give you a feather. But it's it's not that it's a feather that you walk out your door and there's after being loads of birds there and the place is covered in feathers. It's usually a feather just appears somewhere out of the blue and you notice it for the first time. Like I always remember the lady telling me she was feeling so desperate because she had a couple of loved ones in hospital because there had been an accident and she was begging God and the angels. And, you know, she even asked for a sign, you know, of hope. And, you know, she says, Lord, I didn't seem to be getting it. And then one day she goes into our house, you know, she'd come back and change in her shoes and in her shoe was a feather. Like, how did it get in there? 
Like, you know, she said, Lorna, there was never feathers in my house. That's the first time I've ever found a feather in my house. That's you a know. good one. <laughs> yes, definitely. Or sometimes we ask for flowers. But what happens a lot of time is, you know, you, your guardian angel could whisper to you, get Mary or John, even kind of a stranger down the road that you hardly know, a bunch of flowers. And you don't bother, ah. you know, you, you don't bother, you're, you're lazy about it, you know, uh, or you say, oh, that's crazy. What would they think me buying them flowers? You know, it doesn't have to be expensive bunch of flowers. So what happens a lot of the time is that a child, of course, young children listen to their angel all the time. You know, they have no problem in that way. And they might call, you know, a daisy or a buttercup or some small little wildflower. And they're in the park and the park is crowded. And a child has listened and has done that and heads straight over to a stranger and hands them this little flower. I have seen it happen so many times. Guided by angels. Yeah, the stranger yeah. takes it, but a lot of the time, you know, the stranger then drops it. Well, I, I think my new phrase, thanks to you, Lorna, is going to be no laziness. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling people not to be lazy whatsoever. You, you've got to respond so that you can make that deeper spiritual connection for your life. And, and you've got to love you. You've got to love you so you can love others. You know, before we before we leave from the laziness, Lorna, I have a, I teach a technique of watching for what I call snags. When something catches your attention, that's a snag. I hope it doesn't have some horrible connotation in Ireland. <laughs> but yeah. but you know, what, stop then and ask, why did that snag my attention? That flower, that feather, whatever, and that's when the angels move in, right? Yeah, they're all the time attracting your attention to something or to someone. Or just something in nature. It's like, you know, not be lazy when you when you know you should get up and go for a walk because it's been pestering you <laughs> in that in that way. Go for a walk because, you know, your energy could be needed for on that walk. Your energy could be needed for nature, you know, or maybe you will find something that needs a little help. Yeah. You know, you could be walking along and you see a, a little baby bird depending on the time of year, because some mummy birds have this habit of leaving their youngsters, you know, at the side of the road. Doesn't mean you go and pick it up, touch it with your hands, but you can hoosh it, you know, into the bush a little bit to keep it safer. You know, you were meant to go for that walk to help that part of nature. And it can sometimes just be so, so simple. Or in a sense, you know, you're going for that walk and all of a sudden you, you see some wild flowers in bloom and you stop to admire them. And you're, you have this, what would you say? Oh, I'd love to pull the flower. You know, I'd love to pick them and bring them home. But your guardian angel is telling you, giving you a slightly guilty feeling. No, don't. They're very rare. They're getting less and less. Let them blossom. Let everyone enjoy their beauty and let them go into seed so there will be more. Beautiful. Wow. Have the angels, or let me say, how have the angels changed for you over the years of how they interact and work with you? Because we're all evolving, right? Yeah. Um, I always tell everyone, you know, if someone says to you, they know everything and they've learned everything, I would say that's untrue because I'm still learning. If I'm still learning, you know, and I'm still learning, you know, huge, huge amount every single day, you know, um, and I wouldn't know where to start because I haven't even written about half of half of what I see and what I'm learning all of the time. But I know at the moment, I'm working on about three books <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm just writing and then it'll all be sorted, sorted out in that in that way. But to me, you know, I think people need to feel hope in their hearts today. 
you know, the world today, we need to see see that hope and we need to be able to hear the laughter of children and see, you know, even out there, you know, the sun is shining now at the moment, you know, to see how precious and beautiful our planet is and to become more open spiritually. You have to remember, you know, the angels have taught me everything out of nature, not in the building as such, you know, but everything out of nature. You know, they would have had me when we were living with my mom and dad in Ballyman. It was out into that big garden at that time, you know, in among the peas, in among the strawberries my dad had growing. You know, it was, you know, to go down and see how the flo- frogs were doing, because we used to have frogs in, in the garden as well, you know, or climbing that wall or walking to school because it was all country at that time, it no longer is, you know, and everything was about about nature, even standing beside, you know, the tree that had this wasp's nest, you know, it was actually quite a big hole where, where they usually don't need such a big opening. And the angels having me stand there and just watch them and learn to, how would I say this, to see all of the different energy and to hear them singing, to hear their voices, you know, to hear their hum and and how that, in a sense, you know, was good for me. But what I was being shown as well, it was good for the tree. It was good for everything else around because even birds came around, but they didn't go near the wasp's nest, but they hung around because they could hear, Mm. they could hear, and they were enjoying. And I know a lot of the time we say, oh, wasp, hoosh it out. And that's what we do. We we hoosh them out because their sting is harder. And they eat honeybees, you know, so we're kind of a bit negative. But everything in nature, the angels have shown me, you know, have such energy, such light that comes from them, and so many different colors. And just watching even the way that their wings were moving and affecting the air around, seeing the air moving. Now, I know people can't see that, but I can see it. You know, You're motivating me to go for a walk right after this interview and see things <laughs> differently. You know, try it, try and, and allow your, your eyes to open. Allow, I think what helps people, the, the eyes of your soul to see through your human eyes. Yeah. In that in that way so that you see more you know um like science knows now so many things that science can see through different things how would i say but at times i have told some of them before they discovered that mm-hmm. that i could see that and described it already and when they have been able to see it it's the very same Oh, how fascinating. So it's it's like, you know, for us all to open up spiritually. Um, and that's what God wants, the intertwining of the body and soul. Like for us to, you know, have no boundaries, for us to love and care for each other, for us to, you know, to make this world like that little glimpse of heaven. And in the end, we tell God, no, we're not in any hurry to go to heaven. You know, and, and that is. In that way, it's an expression. No, I don't. Would you say it again? Um, that we're not in any hurry to go to heaven. Oh, okay. But the intertwining happens. Remember, you won't get sick. You won't grow old. It's probably the word that the angels taught me from the time I was a child and could never pronounce it until actually angels in my hair came out. I was starting to get to pronounce the word, and that is beyond our comprehension. Everything is beyond our comprehension. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, so much more than what we think we know and what we see. What beautiful words you've brought to us today and and the words carrying that energy, just enthralling. I'd, I'd like to bring up one more topic before we finish, and it's what jumped out at me in the first line of your biography, having just finished rereading Angels in My Hair because I read about you years ago. So it's a real joy to, to interact with you here today. 
but you grew up with so much poverty and your early marriage, constant poverty, not knowing would you have the next meal and holiday meals, not knowing could you even put any meat on the table at all. And um, that's the part I'm not very good at talking about. <laughs> um, it just, how would I say, you know, God had shown me and the angels so many things that would come to pass, but I would never head after them. It was like Archangel Michael saying it was getting near time for me to write the first book. And I had my young daughter in the pram. You know, he brought the message from God. And I was so annoyed with Archangel Michael because I was a mom. I hadn't got time. What was God on about? You know, leave me alo alone, you know, and giving out to Archangel Michael. And he just saying it's getting near time for you to to write and turning to him and just saying, how on earth does God expect me even to write one book when I can't even read or write? I couldn't even write my name at that time. My children used to write the notes for school. Wow. You know, um, and, and I suppose maybe after that, when it did come time, my life changed. But I, I suppose I haven't changed, you know, and I, I don't I don't have understanding for for in a sense for money in that in that way, you know, because you can't take any material thing to heaven with you. But God has given what God has given to us, but we're giving it back out. That's the only way I can and it's, it's like extreme cases it's like well if i could interrupt i just yeah. i had this vision just now of yeah. when if all of us could see the angels like you do if all of us knew with utter certainty we are this light and we are so surrounded by love we wouldn't need material things at all we would just you must be just so filled with the inner abundance that that's why well, I, yeah. I, can, I can just tell you, because I, I know you're, you're saying we'll have to go soon, but in the future, if, if we allow ourselves to grow spiritually, it's our choice. It's all religions come together. It's everything coming together and that intertwining hap happening. You won't need your telephone, by the way. And <laughs> I have been told if companies know that material things won't be in the same way. We won't need all that we have and just look around your room everything you have and your clothing on you comes from nature hmm. every single thing does but in the future it's i remember saying it to someone else in the podcast and and the lady said well that i find really hard to take i said we won't even need bridges to cross a river or a lake hmm. you know because i was shown the children crossing the river without a lake or without a bridge. <laughs> without a bridge. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the evolution of the species and maybe not in this lifetime, but more the more we come to understand who we are, which is what you've really helped us to understand today, Lorna, you know, the more those things will make sense and well, become I, reality. I know we're on that journey because God has me in the world. Um and I'm not meant to be here medically either, you know. But again, I'm a miracle in that sense that I'm still here in that in that way. So many of us are still here and miracles are happening every day in everyone's life. You're alive. You have the gift of life, even if you have aches and pains and you can make a difference to your life. If you do it for you in that sense, you will make a difference to others, to the lives of others and nature around you. But you must have that love, that compassion, that hope. You must allow that beautiful light of your soul to shine from you and to touch others. Kindness touches others. It's like one man said to me years and years ago, he couldn't understand why someone gave their life 
for his, gave their life for his when he considered himself a bad person. Why would someone save my life? Why would someone give their life to save mine? And in a sense, growing spiritually and making that connection to our soul, to God and the angels, and even to the souls of our loved ones, that's what we are doing. We're giving our lives to help others as the future unfolds, as evolution unfolds as well, to make this world like um, a little glimpse of heaven. And I know we can do it. I believe we can. I'll never give up on mankind or on nature. We can do it. Oh. You said you, you couldn't understand how you are a gift or what you have as a gift, but I know that all of us who are, are watching and listening to you today appreciate the gift you've given all of us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on your show and all your listeners. And I pray and ask for all the wonderful blessings that they need now in their lives and for them to give them to give themselves a chance to to believe you have nothing to lose, only to gain. Beautiful. All right, everybody. If you're not inspired now, watch again and again until it seeps through that human exterior and the soul says, yes, this is truth. I love you all. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here again next week. Mm -hmm.